All right, welcome back to Channel 6 TV here on Community Focus. This is Kenny Fogel, your host. I got Lieutenant Jeremy Thompson here with, with, the, with the Kentucky State Police, post number four out of Elizabethtown. And uh, Lieutenant Thompson, first of all, welcome to the show. Appreciate you being here. Well, thanks for having and, me. And uh, I know um, you're probably a busy day today, uh, as always, and you take a few minutes of time out to stop over here and talk to us. And uh, I just want to stop in, just check with you and go, what's going on? I know State Police is a, covers a tremendous part of the area. Now, District 4 now. How many counties do you cover for that? We technically have eight counties. Uh, that's including Jefferson. We don't have as big a footprint in Jefferson County just mm -hmm. by virtue of the number of law enforcement that's already up there. Yeah. Uh, but we have Nelson and Bullitt, uh, LaRue, Hardin, Mead, Breck, and Grayson. So do you have somewhat of like a jurisdiction as to what you would cover or what somebody else would cover? I mean, I know you're not basically covering what somebody else misses, but you probably got some counties, as you mentioned, Jefferson, that's probably got more law enforcement there than other counties that probably you have to spend more time in. Well, sure, there's certain details that we do in Jefferson County where mm -hmm. we do have a more primary function, such as the Kentucky State Fair. Mm -hmm. You know, it's on state property at the mm -hmm. fairgrounds. So we are more of the primary law enforcement agency. But on other details, such as Thunder Over Louisville, Derby, mm -hmm. Oaks, yeah. Um, smaller details that they have, the NRA convention, uh, just different things where Louisville Metro reaches out uh, to a partner in the community and we go up and assist on those details. Okay, well let's say just to give it for example Nelson County and if a crime happens in Nelson County, city limits of Barstown, Barstown Police. If it's out in the county, I know the Sheriff's Department of the County Police and where exactly do you come into the picture on, on something? So is it depend on the size of the crime or, or depends on can they handle it or not? Well, unfortunately, there's enough for all of us to go around. You know, <laughs> right. that's, that's the, uh, the realistic side of law enforcement that really and truly we can't do our job without the assistance of the Sheriff's Department, mm -hmm. the city PDs, and vice versa. Right. You know, the more that we work as a team, the better off we all are. Uh, but as a matter of practicality, uh, essentially, it's, it's nothing much more than who gets there first. Mm -hmm. And then once you get there, uh, we typically have resources that some of these smaller departments, not necessarily Nelson County, but other departments may or may not have. Mm -hmm. In which case, the sheriff, the chief, uh, will reach out and say, hey, will you all handle this? So that's common practice if we are asked to take over a scene mm -hmm. while we're there together. Now, we're not in the habit of coming hours or days later yeah. and inheriting something that's already been right. started. Right. Uh, but if we're there at or near the same time, we don't mind to come in in an instance where we can be of assistance. I know over the last few couple, three years, we've had uh, some very high profile uh, uh, activity in, in Nelson County, the Jason Ellis case, for, for instance, the Netherland family, the Crystal Rogers. I mean, uh, you uh, involved in each and every one of those, I tell you, to some degree. Uh, less with Crystal Rogers than with uh, Jason's murder and the Netherland murders, but uh, the Sheriff's Department is the primary mm -hmm. investigating agency, but the agency, Kentucky State Police, has assisted the Sheriff's Department with Crystal Rogers' disappearance uh, on a, a variety of levels uh, on different occasions. I personally have had little to do with that particular investigation. Yeah. I've changed roles over the last few years at our post, so I'm not on the investigative side as much now as I do the uniform side. Well, I'm going to assume, and when you assume you get in trouble, that uh, you probably got a whole lot more resources than maybe some of the smaller police departments do as far as lab work, things of that nature. I mean, you actually have a lab. And say a lot of police in local areas don't have a lab or they don't have the investigative skills that you that you go through the, to be just the training, if nothing else. So obviously there's some places you are needed much more than others. Well, and that's true. The lab, however, is, it's a little unique in the, in the sense that it is operated by the Kentucky State Police, mm -hmm. but that lab is for all agencies within the state. Mm -hmm. So when the Sheriff's Department or Barstown PD, when they send their evidence to a lab, it goes to the Kentucky State Police lab. Mm -hmm. So it's analyzed by the lab technicians at our KSP labs, and we have various regional labs across the state. Um, so everyone has access to that. It's just a matter of on a weekend, such as Jason's murder, mm -hmm. uh, you know, three years ago, it was Memorial Day weekend. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a matter of allowing our lab technicians to come out and help us at the scene. You know, that was something that's not necessarily unprecedented, but it was uh, a tough decision to make on a holiday weekend. Can we get these civilians yeah. who don't typically work the hours that uniform personnel do can and will they come out and they absolutely did and mm -hmm. those are resources that everyone could have available to them 
but we reached out to folks we knew within the agency and, and made that happen. Well, you mentioned a couple of times, and I, and I know it's just, there's a lot you can say and what you can't say on the Officer Jason Ellis investigation. I mean, not a cold case. I know Absolutely not. Obviously not, but uh, it, is there progress being made that we don't see incrementally or, or something going on that maybe there's a possibility of something breaking at some point? Well, as, as far as something breaking, it could break while you and I are talking right now. And, you yeah. know, if that would be the best news that any of us could receive. You know, I walk out of here and mm -hmm. somebody calls and says, hey, we got that, the break we've been waiting for. Yeah. Uh, realistically, something's being done on it literally every day. Now, depending on which day it is, how much is done on it, but interviews are still continuing to be done. Now, this investigation has been worked a little bit backwards than a normal investigation because of the fact that it was an officer that was murdered. Mm -hmm. And typically, you start inside and you work out with these and it's, it's, been, um, it's been complicated because you have to, at some point, address the fact of normally when you go, when you go work a homicide, if you have someone um, in a domestic related, you know where to begin interviewing yeah. people. With this, when it's an officer murdered, it's, it's backwards from the, what we normally investigate. Mm -hmm. So... Do you start interviewing officers? Do you start interviewing spouses? Do you start interviewing neighbors? Where do you begin? So there's been such a volume of interviews that have been needed to be conducted on this. As an officer, I mean, obviously you're gonna step on a lot of toes. I mean, you can be somebody you may have pulled over or maybe somebody you arrested, or maybe a drug deal gone bad that you already, something you may have walked in on that you just, uh, the, the, somebody didn't want you there. I mean, there's, I, I guess there's a lot of questions in my mind and I'm sure there's the same thing with you, but that's something you have to ferret out, I guess. Well, absolutely, and the possibilities are endless. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the complications to this investigation uh, is the rural nature of where the crime occurred. You know, at, at that time of night on the Bluegrass Parkway, yeah. you know, at that mile marker, I mean, let's face it, it, it's not a street corner here in Bardstown or in Jefferson County where you have a an abundance of video footage yeah. from gas stations or some type of you know business establishment. Yeah. So the rural nature has been very um, taxing on our time in looking for the neighborhood campus. And mm -hmm. one of the things that is very important in an investigation. But secondly, we've never been able to definitively say that Jason was the target. Mm -hmm. And you can ask people within the, the police departments, you know, depending on whether it's BPD, yeah. the Sheriff's Department, KSP, and you're going to get a variety of answers. Some people are convinced without a shadow of a doubt that Jason was the target. Other people, not so much. And then other people all together say, I just think it was random. Mm. Now, again, when you're able to determine if someone is the intended victim, then that's going to help you yeah. in, in the ways of motive. So, again, those things complicated uh, the time of the night that it occurred or time of the morning and then a limited amount of evidence, and then some of the uh, information that was put out early that, although accurate, should never have been put out, and it just, it hampered the investigation. So it's, it's just been a very complicated and frustrating investigation from day one. And I know that's gonna be a hard part of, of, of being in the job you're in, is a lot of things you know that you can't talk about. Right. And simply can't talk for various reasons. One, if you don't have proof, I mean, it's kind of hard to say something you don't have proof, but secondly, it does hamper the investigation if you keep, if, ever, if all the secrets are out there that day, but it, at the same time, people come up with all these conspiracy theories and they come up with all the answers on, on their own, then it probably makes your job even tougher too. So either way, you, you, you can't, you don't win. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's been interesting with some of the, you know, we have the, the website yeah. uh, that's been available. The FBI has been a tremendous uh, help with this. They set up a 1-800 number uh, that was active for a long time. Um, and I don't want to suggest the FBI. There's been, in this particular investigation, at the state, local, and federal levels, mm -hmm. the cooperation has been unprecedented in my career. And I've got almost 19 years with KSP, mm -hmm. and I've just never seen the amount of resources put into one investigation that this particular investigation has. Um, but that being said, w when you have all that information coming in, it can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And the case is literally voluminous, and you have to sort through that. Mm -hmm. So what we've been able to do is we've been able to rule a lot of scenarios and uh, conspiracy theories, if you will, mm -hmm. out and, and close those doors, so to speak, so that if someone says, well, this is what I heard. Yeah. Well, we've been able to put a lot of those to bed. Um, 
but because we haven't had very good information to go on, mm -hmm. we've had to close those doors. And in doing so, we've, we've taken a lot off the table, but unfortunately we have just not gone down the road that we need yeah. to lead us to an arrest. But again, I, I do truly believe that they will come. I spoke to Amy uh, a couple times in the last month and mm -hmm. just kind of reassured her, if nothing else, that we are working on this investigation. It is not a code case. Yeah. I've seen some cold cases. We have cold cases, yeah. uh, unfortunately, but this is certainly not one of them, nor is the Netherland case. Well, speaking of the Netherland case, I mean, obviously there's a lot you can't tell about that. We saw the car from the from the video. I mean, it was a, not, it's always sort of a grainy picture when you see a car or, like, or something like that, but random or planned? I mean, I guess that's a question you, you, you should, I don't know if you've had the, you know the answer to that or not, but still, I don't know. I don't have a, I mean, that's a question we all are concerned about. Is it something that just happened randomly or was it something that was planned out or something that just had to spur of the moment? We just don't know. It's, it's going to be a great question when we find out who's responsible and we sit down and, and again, it's a, uh, it's an unanswered yeah. question right now that we would love to have someone. And that was a, or that is an investigation where early on you, you do have some video surveillance mm -hmm. and, um, uh, there, there was a lot of excitement within the agency when, you know, within the investigative crew as we looked over that and we did neighborhood canvases and determined that and said, wow, you know, we've got a car here. Yeah. And not just a car, we were able to determine with a, a pretty good high amount of certainty a year range. Mm -hmm. And then it just has never come to fruition of, yeah. of where that car belonged to. And the public has, has been phenomenal. We had tips come in. We've investigated all the tips involving those. And it just... It's very odd to have that type of footage to have without the license plate, of course, that, that doesn't yeah, make well, a difference. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but just that time of day, we were really um, hopeful that somebody could point us in the direction, okay, that's, that's John Doe's car, and we're going to be able to go interview him and then get this. Well, I guess my next question was going to be just what you touched on is tips. I mean, I know a lot of crimes are solved because of tips, but I'm sure you get a lot of tips, as you say, that just get so many of them that... Some are off the wall and some maybe you got to sift through all those to figure out which ones are valid and which one's not. Uh, and, and some of them are easier to do that than others. I mean, mm -hmm. to be quite honest, some of them come in and are just so off the wall, so far-fetched mm -hmm. that we'll take it down. You know, they come in on a recorded line and we'll document it, but it's, they don't even bear mm -hmm. any further uh, investigation because the tips are so far off. They're just so random mm -hmm. and the circumstances within that information yeah. are so contradictory to what we know. There are some that come in that are really intriguing yeah. and we'll get somebody on right away, day or night. I mean, we've come out two and three in the morning and I've received calls at home and somebody will call me and I say, well, you know, it's going to take a lot to get me out of bed at two or three <laughs> in the morning at this point. Yeah. You know, what information do you have? And then before you know it, you're getting out at two and three in the morning. And again, unfortunately, you know, it just has not taken us down the path uh, to make well, an arrest. Well, but, a lot of people have information, they just don't know they have information. I think that's the case. They, might sure. be, they think it's so minuscule that you're putting it all together and that one little minuscule piece might make the difference. There's nothing that's too small, there's really not. And you know, if I would plead with the public, if you think you have information mm -hmm. that's never been reported, or if you think you have information that's been reported, but for some reason, you know, no one's contacted you. Yeah. Again, in, in the early stages, there was so much going on. It could have been something we missed. And absolutely, we, we'll throw pride out the window. If, if we have missed something, mm -hmm. if we've not spoken to somebody, please call us back. Mm -hmm. We'd be glad to come out and talk to you. If we talked to you the first time and you recall something that you think, you know, this might be it. Mm -hmm. Maybe that is the small piece. We're more than happy to come back out, talk to them, the public talk to whomever thinks they have information because at the end of the day, the most important thing is to solve this case. Mm -hmm. It doesn't well, matter who, who solves it or who, who's responsible for the information. Right. We just want to make sure we make an arrest. Well, I know uh, obviously the murders and things of that nature make the headlines, but you've got a lot of other things going on too. The, the rise seems like there are drug instances of drug-related crimes is getting on the rise. I mean, I don't know if more people are using drugs, more people have access to drugs, or they're making their own. I just don't know. But I'm sure you're seeing an explosion in, in the drug area that's... Have any idea of what's going on in the drug area, what we can do, or what's happening? You know, I, I don't know what you can attribute that to. Mm -hmm. uh, it does seem that there's been a spike in drug use, mm -hmm. and especially violence associated with drug use. You always have a criminal element. Aside from the drugs themselves, there's always a criminal element because 
people have to have money to purchase drugs, mm-hmm. regardless of what type it is. Right. Well, if they don't have money, and if they're an addict and they can't hold down a job, then they steal. Mm-hmm. And when they steal, they break into homes. And you know, so it's, it's a vicious cycle that continues to occur. But when you add violence into that mix, then it becomes more than just property crimes and becomes personal crimes and certainly ups the ante mm-hmm. um, to, to the public. And those are the crimes that we really need to get a handle on quicker than, it's no, it's not that someone stealing a weed eater out of a garage isn't mm-hmm. important. That's important. That's yeah. someone else's property. Right. They, we need to recover that. But when someone's kicking in a door, you know, doing a home invasion, uh, looking for guns, and that, that's taking it up to a level that is uh, much more detrimental to the society that you live in to find who's responsible for that crime. Well, about 19 years ago, you made the decision to join law enforcement state. What, 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 was, the, what was your motive on that? Uh, it was just something as a kid. You know, I, I had always had interest in law enforcement. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just I watched the state police during the state fair, ironically. And uh, I just watched them, and I just one day decided that's what I wanted to do. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, I've been very blessed to have a career with the state police as long as I have. Uh, I'd like to think it was a successful career, but certainly not over yet. And the cases that we've talked about are, are two of the most high priority cases that I've been a part of in my career. Mm-hmm. And I'd certainly like to see arrests made, you know, and n- not that I would retire the day after <laughs> either of these were solved, yeah. but it would certainly be something that would seem yeah. uh, from a professional side closure. But more importantly, I'd like to see closure for the family on both those cases. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's just, again, it's, it's been very frustrating. Well, not only frustrating, it's got to be uh, a little alarming, I know, especially when a brother in, a, in a law enforcement is, is uh, killed or injured or anything else because you, you face that every day. I mean, when you put that uniform on and go out, you don't know if you go to a, just a, there's nothing routine. People say it's a routine right. traffic stop or a routine arrest. There's nothing routine you're dealing with a criminal element. Because uh, so so we very very much pleased to got people doing that. So if somebody out there right now, some young person is going through school and thinking they might want to get into law enforcement, is there a place for them in the state police? Absolutely. We uh, we are at some of our lowest numbers, manpower wise, that we've been in the history of our agency. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have currently had an academy class going on in Frankfurt, and typically we'll run one class through annually. And if anyone's interested, please feel free to contact us over at Post 4. Mm-hmm. We can set up ride-alongs, uh, Citizens Police Academies. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a variety of things that we can do. We have a recruitment branch that's active, uh, and they get out and they're trying to recruit young men and women from across the Commonwealth to, to become members of the state police. So we certainly have a place for them. Now, if somebody wants to call you, obviously, they don't dial 911. I mean, no, <laughs> not, not for that. Uh, you know, we, we would absolutely take a... Uh, information on the Ellis case. If you have that information, if you want to call 911, we'll take it. But otherwise, no, uh, 270-766-5078 is the number to our post. All right. And uh, that number, it, it rings a lot, but we have six lines coming in, so somebody will get them. All right. Well, like I said, uh, we, we'd like to stay up, up to date with you. We'd like to update people as often as we can as to what we know going on. And again, there's not a whole lot you can report right now other than the fact that it's still ongoing. And uh, that you're still on, on, on the job looking to try to find and still waiting for somebody out there that may have an answer or may have a tip or may have heard somebody, overheard somebody. I mean, there's, there's so many different ways people can hear things. And, and I know the, there's people put things on the Internet or you might be at a, a bar one night and somebody a little more loose-lipped than normal. That could uh, You Absolutely. just never know when, when something's going to, as we said, break and, and give you a call. And, you know, there's a substantial reward in both of the, the cases we've talked about. Mm-hmm. So if you bring that information forward and it leads to an arrest, you know, that's, if nothing else, if it's not doing the right thing because it's the right thing, do it for the money. And, it's, and you mentioned- I you won't know. question your motives. If you bring us the information and, and we're able to solve one or both of these cases, I'm not concerned with your motives as long as we follow up and then we do a thorough investigation from that information uh-huh. and we're convinced that we have the right person or persons i'm not i don't care if it's for the money or for the right thing just and how much of that is anonymous i mean i know that's the question people are going to have they don't want to come out and be a target themselves i mean that's sure. A, i'm sure the people are scared well you know it, it's in today's society you can block numbers you can you can do all the things you want to do you can mail a letter it doesn't happen often but we still receive letters yeah you know send it in 
I don't care if you send it by carrier pigeon. If you get us the information, <laughs> just send it in. We'll take a look at it. We'll run with it and do yeah. what we need to do from the law enforcement side. And uh, we just need that, that information. And I do think someone out there in the public has the information we need. Yeah. I'm convinced of it. Yeah, very few things happen in a vacuum. So usually there's always one or more people involved. And any time there's one, more than one person involved, there's always that possibility. Right. Well, Lieutenant Jer Jeremy Thompson, we'd certainly appreciate you stopping in here. Like I said, I know that this is one of the counties, obviously, that you're in. So uh, uh, we see you out on the road. We'll wave, wave at him and know that you're on the job and they're protecting and serving. We appreciate what you do. Well, thanks for having me. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate you being here and appreciate you tuning in. We'll be back with more of our show here in just a few minutes here on Community Focus. Take care, everybody. <laughs>